This is the 15th lecture for MA1012 at University College Cork. In the last lecture, we talked about matrix multiplication. In this lecture, we'll talk about linear independence and how to set up linear systems of equations in terms of matrix multiplication. In the last lecture, when we talked about matrix multiplication, we pointed out that it was fairly complicated. Um, it was surprisingly complicated compared to the simple rules for matrix addition and subtraction. Uh, that instead of just multiplying matrix entry by matrix entry, we had to multiply a row by a column in all possible ways of choosing all possible rows and columns to produce the product matrix. So it's surprisingly complicated. The justification for doing that is that it helps us to encode linear systems of equations. So let's suppose we start with a simple example of a system of linear equations in some variables. And as usual, we'll make our variables just be called x1 and x2 and x3 and we'll line them up so that the x1s are lined up underneath one another and the x2s underneath one another and the x3s underneath one another. So we've gone up the x1s, x2s, x3s and the constant numbers. Um, we can combine that into a simple uh, matrix equation. Uh, not very a big step, just putting the first row as the first row of a matrix and the second row as the second row of a matrix. That doesn't help us very much, though. It doesn't really do anything to make the the the, the relationship to uh, between matrices and and linear algebra stronger. But we could do something else. We could write it as a matrix product. Um, this part here, with the products of the numbers times the variables, number variable, number variable, number variable, number variable, number variable. We could make all that into a matrix product. Two minus three one minus 1, 1, 3. Those are the numbers that appear in front of the x's, written out just as numbers without any x's. You can then write the x's down here, x1, x2, x3, equals 2, 0. If you run your fingers across this way and down that way, multiplying out 2x1 minus 3x2 plus 1x3, and then the next one is minus 1x1 plus 1x2 plus 3x3, you can see that you're producing exactly these results. Taking the numbers here, putting the x's here, just plain x's with no numbers, all the numbers here, all the numbers are the, just the coefficients in front of the x's written out as numbers, and you get a matrix product that gives you this system, uh, this matrix system of equations is exactly this system of equations. So we started with a pair of equations here, and we've passed to a matrix uh, description of that equation, which is equivalent exactly as exactly the same solutions as that and go back and forth and then again this is equivalent to this so so that system of of linear equations is equivalent to this uh, matrix equation it's convenient symbolically to give these names as matrices and we'll often write something like this is capital a and this is going to be capital x the matrix whose entries the little x's and this guy is some capital B, for example. So we've written our matrix our equation as simply AX equals B, where the unknown is the X. We're given the A and the B, uh, actual matrices of numbers. And this X is a matrix of variables, which we try and solve for. It's often convenient to reduce these kinds of problems down to a simpler kind of problem. Um, we want to say that we want to solve AX equals B. That's the problem for an unknown X. But instead, what we could do is we could try and find, um, well, we'd like to find all solutions. Um, but equivalently, we could just find, so all solutions, capital X. We could equivalently try and find one solution which we'll call, let's say, x1, a single matrix that solves this, this system, x equals x1, is a solution. And then, um, what would be something else you could add to it to make a new solution? Then we want to say any uh, solution x will be somehow expressed as x is the given solution x1 plus some little extra um, 
uh, bit that you add on, x0. So we get, take the given solution, then add something else to it to make a new solution. All the solutions are expressible as some so given, given one particular solution, x0, and then some difference between the two, x0. Um, and uh, where um, the difference, if x1 satisfies this equation and x satisfies this equation, the difference between the two, the two will give a difference between the b's. And so where a x0 equals 0, and so we call this the associated homogeneous equation. So given this equation originally, ax equals b, the associated homogeneous equation is ax equals 0. The associated homogeneous equation is ax equals 0. You drop the b. Um, and uh, and we simply say that if you had if you wanted to solve, find all the solutions of the original problem, it'd be good enough to find just one solution, and then say once I've added on that to get the x equals b part to get the b to pop out, um, I can add on to it anything that makes a x equals zero, and then a times this put together will get a b from here and a zero from here, and so it will satisfy uh, a x equals b. So we can see that all the solutions x are exactly these solutions. One single solution for ax equals b, and then any solution for ax equals 0 added on to it. Let's see what that looks like going back to our example that we had before. So we had an example where we had a to be the matrix uh, 2 minus 1 minus 3, 1, 1, 3, and we had b. Uh, a 2, 0, and we were solving for an unknown x, which is some x1, x2, x3. We that ax equals b was exactly the system of linear equations that we'd started with previously. So that's the problem. Now we could try and find one solution and then add any solution to the homogeneous. Let's see what that looks like. One particular solution, if we go through the process of writing it as linear equations and compute out, we can find that in fact uh, x1 equals minus 2 minus 2, 0 is a solution. It's a solution of the of this system of this ax equals b um, problem. So that's one particular solution. And then, um, then so we reduce to, to solving uh, ax equals 0 the homogeneous, associated homogeneous. And again, we know techniques to solve linear equations, so I won't go through the details of working out how you solve these linear equations. Let's just say that uh, it's possible to then write out explicitly what that system is and go through the process of calculating. And we find that the um, solutions uh, are uh, the any number times x naught, where x naught is um, is the matrix ten, seven, one, and t is any uh, number, any real number. We're doing real matrices after all. We're interested in real number solutions. So it turns out the solutions of the associated homogeneous problem are these, and so by our general theory. We say that um, the solutions um, x to the original ax equals b problem are exactly x has to be the single one solution we found. This one here is a solution to ax equals b plus any uh, solution x naught of the of the homogeneous problem. We found out all the solutions of the homogeneous are just any multiple of this one. So any multiple of this solution. So that solves the homogeneous part, and that's one solution to the inhomogeneity to produce the ax equals b. This guy produces all the solutions to ax equals 0. These guys solve ax equals 0, and this is one solution of ax equals b. And then this is all the solutions of ax equals b. They have to be these things. Let's think about another way of considering the whole story of the linear equation. Um, there are two ways, at least, that you can look at it. Uh, when you go back to your linear equation, let's say we have our equation 2, 3, not minus 3, 1, uh, minus 1, 1, 3. And we wanted to look at that x1, x2, x3 equals uh, 
and we wanted to try and get it to be equal to some matrix B, um, which was simply uh, 2, 0. So there's our linear system of equations. Now there's multiple ways to think of this. Um, one of them is that I'm inputting some unknown vector x into the process of multiplication by a and coming out with this b. So that's how we wrote it as ax equals b, and we think of x here as the unknown. And so we're trying to find an input x that when you throw it into this equation will give the output b. When you throw it into multiplication by a, it gives output b. So that's one approach to th think of it. That's one way to think of it. Another way to think of it is to write it out by expanding this thing out as equal to x1 gets multiplied by these two guys. And so you could write it as x1 times 2 minus 1. x2 here gets multiplied by these two. And so you could write that as x2 times minus 3, 1. So rather than thinking of it as row times column, row times column, I can think of it as these columns are getting multiplied by these numbers. So this column got multiplied by x1, this column got multiplied by x2, this column got multiplied by x3 when I expand out this product. And so what you can think of it is that this is a, a problem of finding some amount of this vector plus some amount of this vector plus some amount of this vector to equal uh, this vector. And again, the unknowns here are now the numbers x1, x2, x3 are unknown numbers, which will, when multiplied by these matrices, add up to give this one. So that's the problem from this different point of view. So again, there are two perspectives we're putting forward. One is try and find an input unknown vector x, which will, when, when put into this process of multiplication by a, will give this output b. That's one way to think of this system of linear equations. Another way to think of it is to say, I want some amount of this, some amount, unknown amount of this vector, plus some unknown amount of this vector, plus some unknown amount of this vector, to equal this vector. Those are two different perspectives, uh, and they're both important perspectives on uh, the same system of linear equations. So this, this leads us naturally to a to a definition, we think of these vectors as sort of the ones we want to work with. We want to somehow, uh, we're allowed to play with those vectors, and we're allowed to make any combinations of them, any amount of this one plus any amount of that one plus any amount of that one. So a, a linear combination, a linear combination of some uh, vectors v1, v2, dot, 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 v something or other, let's say p, is, um, is a vector any amount of v1 plus some amount of v2 plus dot, 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 plus some amount of vp, where um, the x's, just like they were in our problem here, are some un, some not well they may or may be known or unknown it doesn't really matter uh, for the definition of linear combination um, they're just are they are numbers um, in our problem they were unknown numbers but in general they might be known or unknown numbers that you plug in multiplied by the various vectors and you add it all up and you get a linear combination it's somehow thought of as constructed out of these these are the things you're allowed to work with the sort of toys you're allowed to play with and this is one of the things you can make out of those things these with these ingredients this uh, this is a recipe to cook up a vector out of these ingredient vectors the span of some uh, vectors v1, v2, dot, 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 vp is the uh, the collection of all possible linear combinations of them. So uh, the span, span the span of some vectors is the collection of all the linear combinations, all the things you can make up out of them. Note that the span of the vectors is not a vector, it's a collection of vectors, a collection of uh, vectors. So it's not a vector, it's a collection of vectors. And it's, it's going to be, in general, an infinite collection of vectors. Sometimes we have uh, some sort of uh, relationships among vectors uh, that emerge when we start playing with them and we realize that they uh, they're not what are called independent um, uh, vectors. Um, 
let's say uh, v1 dot dot dot. Uh, I guess uh, the notes are using capital X here. Capital X P uh, vectors are. I should have maybe used that there instead of V's. I could but go with X's as in the notes. Um, vectors are said to be linearly independent, which means intuitively something like they point in all sorts of different directions, sort of P different directions, roughly speaking. It's not quite that simple, but that's sort of the idea. They point in somehow very different directions. Um, they're called linear dependent if um, uh, there is no uh, linear relation between them. What's a linear relation? Um, that's to say an equation that they satisfy some amount of now we're using t's instead of x's and x's instead of v's but anyway so some number times the first one plus some number times the second one plus dot 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 so a linear combination uh, vanishing so somehow you can make up zero out of them um, with not all of the numbers t1 to tp being zero so that's called a linear relation we find some relationship between them, between our vectors, our capital X's are our vectors, the T's are numbers, and we've produced a linear combination of those vectors, but somehow it's turned out to be zero. If we somehow killed them all off by suitably adding up multiples by each other uh, with some non-zero uh, non coefficients. Of course, if you added up all just zero times everybody, it obviously gets zero, but it's surprising if there's a way to somehow uh, choose non-zero numbers, add up the vectors and get zero. That's a linear relation. Um, it's a, a, relation, a relationship that's satisfied, an equation that's satisfied between the vectors, this should be xp, satisfied between the vectors even though the coefficients are not all zero. Uh, they're linear dependent if there's no linear relation. Uh, so a linear relation could also be thought of as a linear dependence of the, of the vectors on one another. And again, the intuition is somehow that, that there's, they, there's there aren't, they aren't all pointing in different directions. Somehow one of them is really just built out of the other ones. And finally, we put the two concepts together, um, a basis um, is, is a collection of uh, linearly dependent vectors. Let's say a basis of Rn is a collection of, so n-dimensional space is a collection of linearly independent uh, vectors, all of which are in that same Rn, uh, which span Rn. So being linearly independent means you couldn't uh, somehow um, uh, get away with using fewer of them, but spanning means there's enough of them. You have enough and not too many. Uh, not uh, so, so you have um, just the right amount exactly just the right amount to, to sort of construct, to cook, cook up every vector in Rn out of those particular vectors. So these definitions are very, very abstract, um, but they're very powerful for computational purposes. Let's see uh, what it means to be linear dependent. Let's see if we can find more examples of what this looks like. What does linear dependence look like? What does spanning look like? What does all that sort of stuff look like? Let's suppose we take some vectors. So take x1 to be 1, 0, 2 x2 to be 2 minus 1, 0, and x3 to be minus 1, 1, 2. Um, so now we can ask about making up linear combinations of them. For example, if I take the vector y1, which is minus 3, 4, 10, is it possible to make that out of these somehow, to build that out? If these are the ingredients, can I cook up this somehow? Um, and I can write it, as it turns out, as 2 times uh, x1 uh, minus 1 times x2 plus 3 times x3. I won't do the arithmetic. You could check it to show that that actually did. When you put these vectors in as x1, x2, x3 into this equation, you pop out that y1. So it means that y1 is uh, a linear uh, combination, let's say linear combo, of x1, x2, x3. It's made out of them. You can cook up y1 out of these ingredients.
Um, and so another way of saying that, that it is a linear combination of them is that y1 is in the span. It's spanned by, it's in the span of x1, x2, x1, x2, x3. So it's made up out of those ingredients. How, how can you see that something is or isn't made up out of some ingredients? Let's take the same um, x1, x2, and x3, and let's look at some vector z as 1, 1, 1. Let's see if this z belongs to these, what I, to these x's. What I can do is I can make a matrix that's just got x1, x2, x3, as it, these are uh, its columns, and z as its various columns. And let's write out what those are. So x1 was this guy. Here's x2. And here's x3. And let me put z in. And then I won't do it, but you can apply um, the uh, Gaussian algorithm to produce, the, to produce this thing into um, row echelon form. And what you'll find is you get a, a pivot in the z column. And that means it's not possible to write z in terms of the others. So it says therefore that z is uh, linearly independent of x1, x2, x3. In other words, so z is not, not in the span. Why does it say that? Well, I'll let you figure out why? It's simply that we can't write it as a linear combination of them. In other words, we can't solve the linear equation for z to be multiples of these guys. Uh, that linear equation would have some variable times these guys, some variable times these, some variable times these equal to z. In other words, it would be the system of linear equations associated to this. If you like augmented, we can draw a little vertical line here and make our augmented matrix. So this system of linear equations is a system of equations that expresses that z is somehow written as a linear combination of the x's. The coefficients of linear combination are the unknown variables. So that's how we can work out uh, a test to see whether or not some vector z is a linear combination of some vectors x, 1, 2, 3. We just put the 1, 2, 3's in here. The z becomes the, the column of constants in our uh, augmented matrix. And we just check the pivots when we go through. I'm not going to do it, but you can work out the pivots when you do the, the row echelon form. So the, the general result, which we can, we can state here, is that um, simply that the um, uh, vectors um, x1, x2, dot, 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 x something or other um, are linearly independent if and only if um, the matrix x1, x2, dot, 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 xp has rank p. Um, and that's simply because if you wanted to make a linear combination equal to zero, that would be the linear equation that would have associated augmented matrix putting zeros in here. And so to be linear independent means that the only way to solve it is to solve with everybody equal to zero. But then the uniqueness of a solution of a system of equations is exactly having, uh, having all the pivots to solve for the variables, to solve forcing them all to be zeros. Um, so that's that's exactly why um, why this is true. Uh, why this is true is because you put them into this guy. You make this augmented matrix. There's your equations for constructing a linear combination equal to zero. And you want to say that there should that the only solution the linear dependence should mean the only solution to this equation should be setting all of the variables to zero. In other words, there should be a pivot all the way down, solving for every single variable. Similarly, we can say that. Um, a vector, as we just said before, z is a linear combination of some vectors x1, xp, uh, if and only if, iff means if and only if, um, x1 matrix x1 dot, 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 dot xp, uh, z, um, put a vertical column there for our, this is our augmented matrix, has uh, rank uh, less than or equal to, uh, well, sorry, sorry, has, let's just say has no um, pivot showing up.
in uh, the Z column, that last column. Because if there's no pivot, you know you can solve the linear system. Linear system is exactly some amount of this, some amount of that, da 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 da, da some amount of that equals Z. So that linear system, when you expand it out and put it into a matrix, becomes exactly this matrix here. So we have a test, an explicit test, that says how we tell if a, ma if a, if a vector is a linear combination of other vectors, put it in the last column, we compute it out, and if there's a pivot in that column, when we go through the, 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 the elimination process, through the process of, of row, reduc row reduction, um, then uh, that guy must not be a combination of these other guys. It must not be possible to solve that system of linear equations. But if there's no pivot here, then it must be possible to solve for them, and therefore it said is a combination of those. So that's how we can test these things. Um, similar result with almost the same, really almost the same result, almost the same proof, is the following theorem that um, um, so vectors um, x1 to xp in Rn uh, forming a basis. must have p equal to n. Um, uh, so why is that true? Because uh, we have to be able to have existence of solution of um, uh, of put the vectors in here and we have to be able to solve. So existence and uniqueness um, uh, of the solution. Why does there have to have existence and uniqueness? Because uh, everybody has to be in the span of them. So every Z has to be some linear combination of that's existence. That means there exists a way to write Z as a, as a combination of the X's. In other words, there exists a solution of this linear system. So that's the existence part. The uniqueness is a bit more subtle. Um, so this is really proving this result. Um, so if there, um, if we wanted to, to prove uh, uniqueness, what we're saying is that if you had two different solutions, their difference would solve, um, so why is uniqueness true? The difference between solutions would solve this guy. But the vectors have to be linearly independent, and so you'd have to have, um, we'd have to have, when we compute this out, that there has to be a, um, a pivot in, in each of each, um, solving for each variable. So it pivots all the way down, uh, the diagonal all the way down. So that means that it has to be a p equal to n to get a pivot for every single variable um, because we've only got these p different columns here to solve for variables. We have to have uh, one in, in each um, in each row uh, in, in, in column going all the way down. And so p has to equal n. Uh, by the same argument, exactly the same argument, we get the theorem that um, given a, a basis x1 to xn of Rn, then every um, every vector y in Rn, every n-dimensional vector, is a unique uh, linear combination of those x's. can be written uniquely as some amount of this one plus some amount of that one, da 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 da, as a linear combination of those x's. Uh, the existence is the same reason, and the uniqueness is again the same reason. So, um, roughly speaking, one of the big big steps forward in, in linear algebra um, that over working na naively with just mucking around with linear equations, mucking around with vectors, is this uh, observation that um, we can work in any basis. So, we remember our standard basis uh, when we worked with three-dimensional vectors. We had the va basis which was i equals, one well, can now write it as uh, in this notation, as uh, as matrices, which are uh, column matrices. Um, we before wrote them down as tuples. Um, we wrote that down as one, uh, I is one, zero, zero, when we were talking about, about uh, vectors before. Um, we talked about cross products and dot products and vectors and so on. We wrote them like that, but we can now write them like this if we like. It doesn't matter. Uh, either notation is fine with me. But um, but the point is that this is called the standard basis, right? It's a basis. It's the standard basis. It's the usual way we expand out vectors. A vector is some amount of this, some of that, some amount of that, some amount of that. So a vector x, y, z in three-dimensional space is 
uh, some amount of i, some amount of j, and some amount of k. It expands out to how much i, j, and k it has in it. So we expand out every vector into its components in the standard basis. But a huge step forward occurs when we start to allow ourselves different bases and to change bases from one to another. Um, because it may turn out that there's some basis that's better adapted to a particular calculation. In very high dimensions, that can be enormously time-saving to work with the right basis, the best basis for working with a particular problem. And then the change of basis from one to another uh, may be very relevant to, to uh, expose different different features of, of some sort of linear algebra setup. You have uh, certain basis in which certain issues become clarified and, and another in which something else becomes clarified and so you change from one to the other. So working in the right basis for the problem is really a very fundamental idea um, and it's not obvious. So what happens if we work in something that isn't a basis? Um, we, we, get, have to, we have to mess up somehow. It has to go badly. And so, for example, if we take three vectors in the plane instead of two, and we take, for example, x and y to be the standard basis vector for the plane, but we also allow ourselves another vector, let's say z equals 1, 1, then we don't end up with our expansions being existing in unique, uh, uniqueness. We don't end up with the right way of, the, of studying a vector w in terms of these vectors. Because this w certainly is 3x plus 5y. It has 3 in that slot and 5 in that slot. So that 3 times this, 5 times that will give you 3 here, nothing here, nothing here, 5 here. Added together it gives you 3, 5. So you can see how to expand it out. But you could also say it turns out that it's also minus 2x plus 5z. And it's also equal to 2y plus 3z. Um, I won't do the expanding out to show you, but you can see that it's somehow multiples of x and z or y and z. So there's too many vectors here in this example. If we have too many vectors to form a basis, then we get a kind of slipperiness that if a vector may have many, many different expansions in those basis elements, and we're not sure which one to use, and we're not sure how to find the one that's fast to calculate or, or that's relevant to a particular problem. So we want to make sure that we're working with the right basis, and we want to make sure it really is a basis, that it isn't too many vectors. This is three vectors in two-dimensional space, so that's too many. Um, what we want to do is to work with only two of them, or these, maybe these two, or maybe these two, but only two of them at a time. So we don't like a situation where they have three uh, vectors trying to form a basis in three-dimensional space. It, in two-dimensional space, it doesn't work. You only want two. Uh, in two in two-dimensional space, three in three-dimensional space, and so on, and in n-dimensional space. We still haven't faced the problem of how to divide matrices. We now know how to multiply them. Uh, the problem of dividing can be split into two problems. You have to take, if to find A divided by B, you have to multiply A by the reciprocal of B. The multiplying we know. So we have to find a kind of reciprocal. What's a reciprocal of a matrix, which we'll call a matrix inverse? So next time we'll work out a mechanism for calculating out matrix inverses.